Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. We're moving on to section 5.2. It's called the Dirac Delta Function. You've probably heard about this potentially from Laplace transforms when you took ODEs or even in other courses uh, named after Paul Dirac, uh, even though some of the, the work on these these functions was definitely definitely preceded Paul Dirac, but you know, he was the one who I guess made it famous enough in physics to gain his name. But let's uh, let's go back just a little bit before I get into the Dirac Delta Function to kind of the last, the last theorem of section 5.1, which says, that we can create a kernel k okay, from any linear operator l so long as we have a collection of an orthonormal basis for really a, a function space you want to think of v as a function space in this case so some collection of functions which is closed under scalar multiplication and addition and some sort of inner product defined on those functions which is the integral of those two functions multiplied together integrated over their domains and we're looking for an orthonormal basis of kind of this collection of functions. Suppose that we do have an orthonormal basis, then we can find a kernel, an integral transform kernel K, by computing the image of an element of the orthonormal basis underneath the linear operator, and then taking the inner product against another element of that basis. And that really mirrors the same version of the theorem for matrices when we have an orthonormal basis of a vector space, maybe finite dimensional vector space, uh, and, a and a linear map L, then you can represent a matrix with respect to that specific orthonormal basis by computing the linear map against one element of the basis and then taking the dot product against another element of the basis. So really there's nothing different when we start moving into function spaces where inner products are now defined as integrals of one function against another. And we have this theorem, but kind of the, the big question about this theorem is whether or not these sorts of orthonormal basis for a function space even exist. Okay, so that's really where we're headed, is a question about orthonormal basis of function spaces. And unfortunately, we're not there yet. We, we don't even quite get there for uh, really two more sections after this. So section 5.5 is really, 5.4 and 5.5, kind of a mixture of the two of them is where we'll finally figure out where, where orthonormal basis of function spaces can show up from. But we kind of have the next, next best thing here in section 5.2. This is the Dirac delta function. So I just want to start out by saying our favorite function space, this is uh, L2, which means square integrable functions over the domain omega. Here's my definition of square integrability. I square the function and I integrate over omega and I hope that that is uh, finite. This function does not have a, a, an orthonormal basis where the, the indexing on the orthonormal basis is, is exactly omega, right? So that omega on the index of the orthonormal basis is the same omega that's here and here. And here, this is the domain of my functions. We don't have a collection of orthonormal basis that's parameterized over the domain of functions. We, we can actually find, you know, collections of orthonormal basis um, with other domains. But that kind of that kind of defeats the, the purpose of our representation from earlier. So we really want the representation to have the same indexing as the domain. We want the, the orthonormal basis set to be indexed over the domain. What do we get instead? What we get instead is the Dirac delta function, okay? And I really want to emphasize that there's some quotation marks around this word function here. And I include it down here, contrary to its name, the Dirac delta function is not a function. So don't go around thinking that this will uh, obey all of the properties that functions obey. It does satisfy something called a generalized function which means that, okay, some of the properties of functions definitely agree with the Dirac delta function, but other properties of functions don't. So you just have to be careful. Um, if you get really used to specific operations on functions, some of those do not apply to the Dirac delta function. Other operations do. So you just have to kind of work with this object enough to, to get used to that, or you can actually read about generalized functions if you want to, to see exactly which operations you can use with the Dirac delta function. Multiplication is one of them that you, that you really can. So I can multiply two Dirac delta functions together and get something meaningful in a lot of situations. Anyway, so the Dirac delta function has a definition even though it's not technically a function. And its definition is, is that it kind of always takes this form of, of the lowercase delta, there's my Greek lowercase delta, and when I convolve against it, this is a convolution integral, when I convolve against the Dirac delta function, all this does is it extracts the value of the function there. So whatever is going into the, the convolution is, is just the output. Uh, this is known as the sifting property and in many ways, for at least for this book, we are going to consider the Dirac delta function as defined by this property. It's not really defined as a function in any other sense. It's defined exactly by its ability to perform this manipulation on functions. And this function f needs to actually be special. It needs to be continuous at the point x in my domain. So as long as function f is continuous there, the Dirac delta function is defined by this property and nothing more. It really has no other definition so far as we are concerned in this book. You can define it other ways, but within this book, we're just going to define it this way.
So then I move on to the second definition, which I call the space of test functions. And what we want to think about, why am I introducing this here, is that this is the natural space of functions on which the Dirac delta and the first derivative, the second derivative, dot, 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 are well defined. OK, so this space which is called the space of test functions. It's kind of the space where, where the Dirac delta function, its first derivative, its second derivative, and so on are well defined. Reason being, I define the derivative of the Dirac delta function to be the negative derivative of f here. I define the second derivative to be you know, the positive f uh, double prime, the third derivative to be the negative again, f triple prime, and so on. Basically, higher derivatives of delta get defined by via um, formal or symbolic integration by parts. Okay, so integration by parts, if I had a, if I had a prime on delta up there, what you would want to do with integration by parts is push the prime onto f, but the price you pay to push it there is a negative sign, and then you would also get boundary terms with integration by parts, but you want the boundary terms to be zero, defined to be zero, this is what the physicists want, at least. And what does it mean to define the boundaries of all derivatives to be equal to 0? It's right there in the definition of the test functions. So test functions are basically just the, the collection of functions on some domain for which as many derivatives as I want exist, and all of those derivatives have boundary value 0. This is what it means to be in the space of test functions. And so the Dirac delta function is kind of naturally defined against f's here that satisfy you know, this property of the delta functions. And this space is truly a space of functions. Um, it's not closed. So if, you, if you've taken a real analysis course, you know what uh, closure of function spaces is. This is not a closed function space, but it is a, a vector space. So it's closed under um, addition and scalar multiplication. It's not closed under a norm. And this space is naturally endowed with the inner product that we're kind of already seeing, where you just take the one function, you multiply the, by the complex conjugate of the other, and then you integrate over the full domain. Um, so this is an inner product space even, it's just not a complete inner product space, which is what I have in the following remark. D, which is my space of test functions, is not complete. If you know what that means, just keep that in mind, in the back of your mind, that the space of test functions will not be complete. So if you ever want to complete uh, sequences or, or make sure that a sequence of test functions converges, you actually have to expand your space a little bit. But for now, we're not going to worry about that. It's not too terribly important for everything we're going to try to get through in, in this book. So we're not going to worry about completeness, but we will worry just a little bit about its definition, this space of test functions where all of the derivatives exist. And then the boundary values are equal to zero. So here I really have the, the primary theorem. And that is that I have an orthonormal, put it in quotes, basis and a quote basis representation of test functions. That's That should all be in quotes because normally when you define a basis of a vector space, you're talking about elements within the vector space itself. And in this case, our basis is exactly the Dirac delta functions defined by the following, and it isn't a member of test functions. We just want to be a little bit careful because that, that can be a little tricky when you're trying to apply maybe some linear algebra techniques where you assume that the basis that you're, you're indexing over is an element of the space. It's not in this case, but it does satisfy the following properties that if you take the inner product of two of them with distinct uh, subscripts, right? This is These are really the indexes, just like when you would index a set of vectors ei i from 1 to 7 or something like that. It's the same sort of thing you can index over the domain. If we look at the inner product of one delta function against the other, what that gives us is actually the delta function of, of one subscript minus the other subscript, the true Dirac delta function, right? On the left-hand side, these are basis elements. On the right-hand side, this is the Dirac delta function. So the basis elements are defined by the Dirac delta function. If I don't put a subscript by delta, it means Dirac delta. If I do put a subscript by it, I'm, I'm referring to the basis elements. And moreover, what we get is that every function in this space of test functions does have a unique basis representation given by the inner product of the function against the delta function and then reconstructed against the delta function. Uh, that's kind of fairly straightforward. It's just by definition over and over again because the first inner product f of delta by its definition will give you f of x and then you're computing that against delta sub x and then integrating over all possible x's in the domain, of course, that should just reconstruct f for me. So it's really just by definition over and over again. But that makes this useful because this is kind of that thing we were looking for from the beginning so that we can find kernels l dx dy. So we finally found that object that we've been looking for from the beginning, 
so that we can we can compute kernels of operators. So now we've got some examples where, where we see what the kernels of some specific operators are. The identity operator is kind of everybody's favorite operator. It's the one that leaves functions invariant. So the identity ID against the function f stays as the function f, and it has an integral kernel representation given by precisely that the integral kernel is the Dirac delta function. And so in some ways you can think about the Dirac delta function as the quote-unquote identity insofar as integral transforms are concerned. So that's really what the delta function is, and we get this directly from theorem 5.1.15, where we just compute the inner product of the image of the identity of the delta function against the delta function, and we see exactly delta x minus y show up. So that's going to be our kernel. We can also compute the kernel of the gradient. So suppose that we have the gradient operation. That's going to have the integral kernel representation as negative gradient in the y direction. So keep that in mind that when we have a kernel and we put the y variable first, that's the direction that you take the gradient in if you're trying to represent the gradient. And you can show this pretty easily just by computing, according to our theorem, what k would have to be if you computed the gradient uh, against one delta function compared to the other delta function. And finally, if we compute the kernel of a multiplicative tensor, so give myself a tensor field and then a scalar product there, a scalar multiplication, we're going to get an integral kernel representation where I just consider the tensor field scalar multiplied by the delta function on the right. Um, and now notice that the gradient was in the variable y, right? The, if I'm multiplying by a tensor, I'm in the variable x. So you just got to keep that in mind in which cases we're using the variable y here. So every time we're taking derivatives, use the, the first variable, which is the one that shows up in the right of the delta function. Anytime I'm multiplying by a function, I'm going to take the derivative or the, the variable of the second input to the kernel. So those three examples are going to be very useful basically for this theorem, which says, hey, how can I compute a kernel representation of a linear PDE? So you can imagine here I've got a linear PDE. This is kind of what all linear PDEs should look like in general. And suppose my boundary conditions are fixed at zero. That's actually pretty important. But we're going to consider this operator itself, I mean, technically paired with its boundary conditions, but let's just consider the operator itself for now. What I can do from the previous three examples is translate each one of those A's and each one of those gradients. The A's were like tensor fields, so those translate as X, and the gradients were all gradients, so those are going to translate like a negative gradient of Y to the K power. And then the delta function comes along for the ride. And so you can translate a PDE into an integral kernel, just by replacing that really the gradient with its negative gradient in the y direction and then shoving a delta function in front of it. And then all of a sudden we have just a giant kernel where I could represent this entire PDE if I wanted to as a, an integral transform. Right, in this case, what would that look like? It would be the integral transform over omega of this uh, acted against phi of the variable y dv y. So this would actually equal, truly equal the left-hand side of this PDE but now it's an integral transform instead of just a, an operator. So that's a very nice theorem. And then before I get into some examples of, of using this theorem, let's just cover this brief proposition, which basically says we can construct higher dimensional delta functions. So I've got the d-dimensional Dirac delta function constructed. There it is, there's my d-dimensional Dirac delta function. You just construct it by products. This is product notation. So this just means product from i equals 1 to i equals d. So it's just like summation notation, but for products. So I'm just computing a product of all of uh, the one-dimensional Dirac delta functions. So take a bunch of one-dimensional Dirac delta functions, multiply them together in each of their respective coordinates, and you'll get your n-dimensional Dirac delta function. There's a nice proof of that if you want to read through it. But now we're actually going to apply this theorem, right? So the theorem here says, OK, what is the kernel representation of a linear PDE? There's a linear PDE. I would like to represent this as an integral transform PDE. Well, what can I do is I can translate this term into derivatives in the transform variable, right? So if, if I'm working with an integral transform of the variables x, y, and y, then my kernel of my integral transform needs the variables x and y, but it also needs conjugate variables that need integrating over, so I'll give them the names z and w. So I need a conjugate variable for each of the x and y's that show up in the original PDE, give them the name z and w, let's recall that derivatives, right, two derivatives in z, derivatives get replaced, their variables get replaced by the theorem above, 
But multiplying terms, multiplicative terms like the x squared, do not get replaced. So the derivative, I replace the x with a z. The multiplicative x squared, I do not replace with a z. So that's all I want to think. Derivative, replace the derivative of z. x squared, do not re replace. 2xy is going to come over here as 2xy. Derivative x, derivative y, need, they both need replacing. There's the derivative in z. There's the derivative in w. y squared, I'm not going to replace. And then two derivatives in y, I do replace y with a w. So you just replace the derivatives with their conjugate variables and you don't replace mul multiplicative terms with their conjugate variables. And then you know make sure you have the right collection of Dirac delta functions. In this case, because we're in two dimensions, we have a two dimensions gives a product of two Dirac deltas. So in each term, you're gonna have a product of two Dirac deltas. And you'll notice that, okay, technically each of these partial x's should have been replaced with a negative partial z because the gradient gets replaced with its negative, but of course, uh, two copies of a negative one because everything's squared. I really have a negative one squared, so there's not gonna be a negative sitting around here. So that's why it didn't get replaced with a negative. I repeat this one more time here with the second example. We're still in, in two dimensions here, but what's gonna happen is here's my multiplicative term. That's gonna stay the same. Here's my derivatives in x, those get modified to derivatives in z. Here's a multiplicative term, it stays the same. Here's a derivative in x and y, they are replaced with a derivative in z and a derivative in w. And then here's a multiplicative term, it stays the same. Two derivatives in y, both turn into derivatives in w. So there's a second example of us translating a PDE into an integral kernel. So you could represent the entire PDE as an integral transform if you wanted to. Anyway, a little bit of a shorter section today. I hope that's okay with you. I'm sure it is. But there was just some practice with the direct delta function, um, you know, whether it's in its definition or in its use with the derivatives translating PDEs into integral transforms. I'll see you in the next class. Bye.